Let me give you an example. Let's say you come up with a wacky idea, like you want to do income redistribution with an inflationary currency. So Bitcoin is gold bugs and um, uh, bias towards early adopters. Let's say you want to take the opposite approach. You want to create an inflationary currency, and you want to have every 10 minutes, every round, you want to do income redistribution from the addresses with the most money to the addresses with the least money. Some weird political approach. Okay? Um, now I'm not commenting on the politics. I'm just saying. You, you've got a different perspective on algorithmic politics, which is what this is, and you want to bootstrap that. Right now, if you try to do that with an alt chain, the problem is that in order to recruit miners, those miners have to agree with your algorithmic politics. You have to find miners who are willing to put their mining power behind the idea and behind the potential success of an income redistribution currency. If you put it on Ethereum or if you put it on Counterparty, you don't need to do that because they're mining for everyone on Ethereum, not for your political perspective. So you can actually achieve the scale of security without having to recruit a specific political viewpoint. And that, in turn, means that it's not only very difficult to open an up chain, it also means it's very easy to do innovation at all levels on top of these platforms. One door has closed but the other one opens wide open, and now you can have enormous diversity of opinion and innovation on top of these platforms. It creates a blossoming of innovation. We saw that again. HTTP is a great example of how that happens uh, in networking. Yes, absolutely. Um, there are, a couple, there are quite a few, actually. Uh, uh, Freikoin, uh, spelled the German way, F-R-E-I-C-O-I-N, uh, is a demarage coin, which means it has a negative interest rate that encourages uh, spending and consumption instead of uh, saving and hoarding. Um, and people are working on uh, essentially proof-of-stake redistribution per round coins to implement what Switzerland is calling basic uh, income. Guaranteed basic income. You got Fluttercoin. Yeah. Fluttercoin is proof of block, proof of transactions. So the more you consume, you actually get rewarded coins for consuming. Right. Yes. That that would be perfect for the uh, North American continent. Shop <laughs> 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 your way into wealth. That is a winning proposition. <laughs> Without a doubt, we're 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 going to see we're going to see a lot of different uh, uh, chains reach the level of maturity where and, and it's really it's not about the mining function per se. What it is is about when you start taking the core protocol interfaces and the semantics of the protocol, the interpretation and implementation of that protocol, the little quirks. Bitcoin, like any protocol, is full of little quirks. It's not the rules are this big. And then the list of exceptions is this big, right? Uh, if you try to implement a full node Bitcoin at the moment, you have to implement every bug and every quirk all the way back to the first version of Bitcoin. And trust me, there's a lot of bugs and quirks in there. It's very difficult to do. So every protocol that gets implemented, if you implement all of those quirks in silicon, you put them in firmware, and then you distribute them in a locked box that's hard to upgrade in an embedded device, on a watch, on a vacuum cleaner, on a traffic light, on a vending machine, on an ATM. That's where you start seeing protocol ossification. It's when you take it out of the realm of general purpose computing, where you can throw three updates a week at the user and get them updated, to embedded telecom devices, where it takes three years to do an upgrade and pass it through QA and testing, because it's embedded in a giant telecom switch. And we're going to start seeing cryptocurrencies being implemented in embedded hardware. Already we're seeing it with the Trezor. In fact, uh, someone asked me about the Trezor earlier. If you watch the discussion that's happening on BIP32, hierarchical deterministic wallets, people are proposing changes to the fundamental implementation of, of HD. <coughs> and the answer that keeps coming back is, we've already shipped version 1 of Trezor. 
and it's already got the basic BIP32 implementation. So you can't change that spec now because it will invalidate what we've already done. That is a glimpse of what's to come. As we go mainstream, this is going to happen across thousands of devices, and it's going to affect broader and broader chunks of the protocol until eventually you can't change anything. Uh, because otherwise you make it incompatible with everything that's already out there. So side chains are very interesting because they allow you to essentially create uh, horizontal links between different chains. Today, chains are linked um, very elastically through external functions. Essentially, uh, take Cryptsy. Everybody here familiar with Cryptsy? Right? Uh, Cryptsy is an exchange where you can trade various um, altcoins with each other. Um, and there, there's other Vicurex and, and others. I don't know if Vicurex is still around. I think they crashed. Uh, so um, exchanges that provide liquidity between altcoins essentially form a, a, like a rubber band link between the coins, because then it allows uh, volatility or fluctuations on one side of the equation to then ripple across through the exchange and start affecting the other side of the equation. So Bitcoin goes up and it causes this ripple, and that ripple hits and brings up the altcoins on the other side. You see this delayed reaction, there's an elasticity between them. It's like they're connected with a rubber band. Um, so this is a very loose connection today, which is primarily affected through the uh, market-based trading between the coins. Sidechains would allow you to automate that function in the form of a decentralized exchange whereby you can transmute a coin into a holding on an alternate chain or on a different chain, which may be an altcoin chain or maybe an alternative version of the Bitcoin blockchain, say the beta chain, where you're testing new features, or the micropayment Bitcoin blockchain, which has faster confirmations and much smaller transaction sizes, or whatever else. And the idea being that you take a chunk of Bitcoins, Let's use the first example, which is Bitcoin, to something else. You take a chunk of Bitcoins and you encumber them in such a way that you could resurrect them as a different coin at a specific exchange rate on another chain. Uh, you do whatever you want to do with some transactions. Then you provide some proof of work that, that they existed in that all chain and are encumbered there and transfer them back. Uh, the process of transferring from one chain to another is called a one-way peg. And it was first uh, described by uh, Adam Back, who is uh, one of the most famous cryptographers. He's the guy who invented Hashcash, which is the basis for proof of work. Uh, Greg Maxwell, who is another brilliant cryptographer in this space, one of the core developers, um, invented a way to do a two-way peg, which allowed you then to bring coins back uh, without destroying them. So the idea of side chains, which is being experimented on right now, is to create bi-directional links between chains that allow you to move value from one to another. Is the promise there that you can build features on these side chains that you wouldn't in an ossified Bitcoin future? That, you're that opens no? up a lot of possibilities. It opens up the possibility of decentralized exchanges between alternative currencies. It allows you to convert uh, things that are proof of work into things that are proof of stake, into things that are proof of resource, for example, with MateSafe or something like that. Um, it also allows you to have a main master production chain followed by a beta chain, a feature testing chain, a development chain, a micropayments chain, various variations of the same currency and move value between them. And then of course, you know, you're not going to be doing this in your wallet manually. The idea is that if this is properly implemented as a protocol, your wallet would handle this as an abstraction, right? So if you need it uh, to do a micropayment, it would recognize that, encumber your bitcoins in the primary chain, move them to a different chain, implement the transaction there, and then move back. Uh, so you might see that kind of evolution in an abstraction. In fact, I expect we're going to see more and more abstraction in the wallet side to handle multiple alternative currencies, contracts, uh, side chains, tree chains, and all of the other functionality in such a way that you don't know that you're doing that. You just see this as a special purpose transaction, and because it has certain characteristics, uh, if you try to tip, it converts your Bitcoin into Dogecoin and sends Doge. If you want to pay the national debt, you stay in Bitcoin. If you want to uh, you know, uh, implement a legal contract, it converts into Ether to pay for the contract in Ethereum. 
so you may see a much more flexible world. Uh, the way I look at it is the same as email, instant messaging, video call, voice call. Originally, those were very distinct networks with very distinct clients. And now you see unified interfaces, uh, Facebook, Skype, and, and many others that are basically allowing you to quickly switch from communication modality to communication modality depending on the use you're trying to achieve. And so I expect you'll see that in wallets too. Merge, merge mining is a difficult sale right now. So merge mining is the idea where you're doing mining um, and instead of just mining for one proof of work algorithm, you're mining for either multiple versions of the same proof of work algorithm or multiple algorithms. Uh, for example, Namecoin, which is the decentralized DNS system, uh, almost, the, almost all of its mining happens in merge mining pools against the Bitcoin blockchain. So whenever people mine Bitcoin, they're also mining a bit of Namecoin on the side. Um, despite the fact that merge mining has existed for two years, it's only really prevalent in Namecoin. We haven't seen it spread beyond that. So that's one of the disadvantages of sidechains. Uh, Peter Todd has proposed an alternative called tree chains, which is basically a hierarchical mining structure where you have a master root block that's being mined, and it has a number of children in branches that can go many layers deep. And you can have varying levels of difficulty, and they can correspond to different um, currencies or other chains. And, and essentially, you're mining the entire tree at different levels. Um, that's a very interesting proposal. Uh, and if I told you I understand exactly how it works, I'd be lying. Don't ask me any difficult questions about tree chains. I'm going to wave my hands a lot and give you some vague answers. But it's very interesting, and it's one of the side chains, tree chains, all of these really demonstrate that the core concept of the consensus proof of work algorithm is still in its infancy. This is a brand new science for distributed computing. It's in its infancy. It's opened the door for an enormous amount of variation. We've barely scratched the surface on what you can do with it. Um, there's a lot of very smart people figuring out ways to do more interesting things, uh, which is really ironic because as people are trying to um, essentially deny Bitcoin and they're saying it's a Ponzi scheme or they see it as a currency, everyone in this room understands that Bitcoin is not a currency. It's a it's a value transfer network with a decentralized consensus mechanism. Uh, but the funny thing is that we're so far beyond currency already. Five years into this. The amount of research that is going on in capabilities around the consensus algorithm itself is staggering. Um, so by the time they figure out it's not just the currency, we've moved on, like way past that. All right, let's uh, yes. So how does a consensus protocol like Ripple fit into the scheme? Um, Ripple is interesting because it um, it provides a um, a distributed IOU settlement mechanism, or a distributed debt settlement mechanism, a debt issuance mechanism, that would allow for the liquid transfer of uh, debt instruments between different types of asset classes. Like, here's some silver, give me some Bitcoin in return. Here's some gold, here's some dollars. You could do some interesting things with it. Um, I think Ripple is a great idea, uh, implemented uh, through a somewhat limited implementation of technology that was open source too late and uh, through a absolutely terrible set of organizational structures and corporate decision making that doomed that to failure. I'd love to see someone fork it and build something useful out of it. I would expect that most likely what we're going to see is Ripple re-implemented as 15 lines of Ethereum code and we'll just move on past that. You can implement most of what Ripple does in Ethereum, uh, and it's actually a much better conceived design. Uh, but the, the fundamental flaws with Ripple are not te technical. They're not the innovation is great. The idea is great. The idea of a decentralized uh, debt settlement system is great. But the organization that built it and the corporate structure they chose and the way they pre-mined it is uh, fundamentally flawed.
So Bitcoin can currently process 7 to 11 transactions per second, and that limit is entirely artificial and entirely imposed by the block size limit, which was imposed artificially. Uh, it can be raised. And there's at least a dozen proposals on how to increase the scalability of the core transaction processing. And that problem will be solved when it's a problem. It's not currently a problem. It's not a problem that is slowing down adoption or slowing down merchant processing. Um, it <coughs> solves with a number of different ways. We're already seeing, for example, off-blockchain transactions as one potential solution that increase the velocity. Um, a great percentage of Coinbase's transactions, for example, are off blockchain, uh, and that's not counted in the seven transactions per second. Micropayment channels solve that by aggregating. Uh, we're going to see pruning of the transaction tree to solve that. Um, I look at problems like that, optimization problems, as problems that we need to consider much further down in the maturity and adoption curve of the technology. Essentially, if you look at adoption curves of technology, you start with experimentation. Uh, you know, when, when the technology starts expanding, then you have a period of massive fragmentation where everybody runs off in different directions to implement their own thing. We're going through that at the moment with Bitcoin. Uh, then you have a period of standardization, where you start really creating some common standards based on the experience from the previous cycle, um, and you standardize on some common practices. And then finally, you get to optimization, where you start solving performance and scaling problems. We're not there yet. We're still in the experimentation phase, and to try to solve optimization problems in the experimentation phase is a waste of time because you haven't standardized most of the things yet, and it's not necessary. Um, I look at these discussions in terms of Bitcoin will never scale back past seven transactions per second. I've heard those transactions. I've heard those discussions at least a hundred times on the internet. I can show you a series of articles. In the IEEE and the ACM and the Wired magazine and a whole bunch of other publications that are respected in the internet domain that said Ethernet can never scale above one megabit. There are fundamental physical constraints, which means Ethernet will never scale above 10 megabits. There are fundamental physical reasons why <laughs> Ethernet will never scale above 100 megabits, 1 gigabit, 10 gigabits. Every single year there's an article about that. The telco company said, um, the internet can never scale to do voice. The internet can never scale to do quality voice. The internet can never scale to do video. The internet can never scale to do quality video. <laughs> now, 75% of all on distance calls happen on Skype. The point is that when it needs to scale, then the investment is there to scale it, because the incentives are aligned to solve those problems when they occur. Right now, they're not a problem. And that's why nobody's really solving it yet. Do you think people will view privacy as an optimization? I hope they don't, but it seems to me that that's kind of a big problem where we see this, okay, let's put off optimization until later, but if we don't get privacy right right now, we're screwed. What, do you, what are your comments on that? If you watch any one of my videos, you'll know that that's the thing I'm really concerned about. I, I think solving the anonymity and privacy issue is, is something we need to solve before the protocol ossifies because we won't get too many chances. Otherwise, we will succeed in disrupting the existing financial services infrastructure with Bitcoin, and a decade from now we're going to need to disrupt Bitcoin with something else. And that's okay, because once you open the door to currency choice, it's going to be a hell of a lot easier to do the next wave of disruption. We made this fundamental mistake with the internet. Tor was an afterthought. Proxies were an afterthought. Strong encryption was an afterthought. And we got pawns by the NSA. And we need to learn that lesson fast, because otherwise, big data analytics on the Bitcoin blockchain can destroy your privacy unless it's done right. So I'm a huge supporter of uh, either core fungibility and anonymity capabilities right in the protocol, or uh, meta layers that achieve that uh, with services above. Coin join, coin swap, ring join. Uh, a bunch of other services that can do anonymity. Anybody who tells you that anonymity is a tool that only anarchists, terrorists, and pedophiles need is a privileged, middle-class, North American resident. They don't live in a country where you get shot for owning foreign currency. They don't live in a country with a brutal and oppressive dictatorship. Um, five billion people do. They live in <coughs> shitty countries. And they need anonymity, because you cannot have a tool for empowerment and freedom of association if you assume a benevolent government. 
like we have mostly here. And you know, libertarians can tell me this is not a benevolent government here. Well, you haven't traveled enough. Uh, it gets far worse everywhere else. So the point is that it is a luxury to say that anonymity is not necessary, or that anonymity is something that only criminals use. Uh, because in many places in the world, democracy is criminal. Freedom of political expression is criminal, and those criminals need anonymity. So, for those reasons, I'm a very strong proponent of building Bitcoin with the anonymity features that are needed for the most oppressive places in the world, not the most comfortable democracies in the world. And that also protects us against the eventuality that ours doesn't go so well. I'm not too comfortable with the state of democracy in this country either. So. That's, that's my opinion on anonymity. Have, have you seen Bitcoin before? Have you looked at the code? It's a mess. So Bitcoin Core is a hairball. Uh, and now it's a hell of a lot better than it was two years ago, and a lot better than it was when Satoshi introduced it. It was an absolute disaster. Um, one thing we do know about Satoshi Nakamoto is not a very good programmer. Uh, <laughs> if you see the first version, it's disaster. So, but the point is that um, I think the core software is getting more modular, and the code is getting better <coughs> instrumented, and it has better test coverage than ever before. And big chunks of it have been refactored very effectively. We're seeing such improvements in Bitcoin J. We're seeing uh, Lib Bitcoin, which provides an alternative, and that's much more modular. But that's also being heavily refactored and cleaned up as we speak. So, um, you know, these are the first implementations of an experiment, so they're getting better over time. I would like to see more full node implementations that are alternative. If you look at the network at the moment, 98% of all of the nodes are running the core Satoshi client 086, and the rest is a statistical anomaly in that. That is a dangerous monoculture, because that means that a single bug can rip through the entire infrastructure and, and bring problems. So I would like to see more diversity of implementations along a core standard protocol, but it's difficult to do. Um, yeah, I, it would be great. If, if you want to contribute to the core development team, uh, they do not need more features. Uh, they need more test coverage. Uh, they need more refactoring. They need more pull requests, they need more bug fixes, and they need more testers. So test it on a bunch of different systems they're not testing it at the moment, and do that consistently, and you can really make an impact on the core development. I noticed also, I think uh, Amir said that like, uh, there are some places where they're like copy and paste, copy and paste the code, and it like, could be simplified in some ways. Oh, I mean, you know, this is a massive software product, project. It's a massive software project uh, with uh, you know tens of thousands of lines of code, and within there you're going to see every poor programming practice you could imagine uh, illustrated in all its hideous glory, uh, from copy pasted code to redundant systems to you know all of the core principles of uh, you know dry and uh, code modularity and no side effects and all of that. I mean, you, you can find hundreds of examples in any single file in Bitcoin Core or any of the other implementations uh, that violate those principles. We are still in the experimentation phase, which means that people are expanding the exposure surface of features faster than they are going back and refactoring the core code to improve the overall quality and test coverage. Uh, I think over time, over the next year, you're going to see development of features slow down, and you're going to see a lot more bug fixes and refactoring in Bitcoin Core. What I'd like to see is Bitcoin Core become the less featureful, solid production quality code, but we're a long way from that. So, yeah, help with testing. Yes? Okay, so one of the fascinating uh, Challenges seems to be this reconciliation of the role of uh, Bitcoin as both a fiduciary instrument and also as a store of value. Yeah. And the fact that now it's whatever six and a half billion dollars of market cap, that's bigger than a penny stock 
but it, I guess it's equivalent to about Afghanistan or E-Trade's uh, market cap yeah. in terms of its size. So uh, with all of the rice bowls potentially broken from all of these financial service industries or even countries or uh, other people that have vested interests in the way it is, it seems like it's ripe for all kinds of um, uh, mischief or intentional um, market manipulation that would be a deterrent to its adoption both for the fiduciary transactions and also for its store of value. And I just wondered what you see as a way of, uh, of seeing that process through, either through... Uh, yeah, more people to use it, the bigger it gets, the harder it is to break it. I mean, that's the simple truth. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I want to focus on technical questions for the most part, and I know we've, we've sidetracked a tiny bit into the okay. political... Okay, well, I thought that was sort of an extension to the proliferation of alternative things like contracts, which seems right. like that's a, an integral part of the uh, underlying... Yeah, I mean, this is still a technology in its infancy, and as a financial services instrument, it's even more in its infancy. Uh, all that Bitcoin has achieved so far is that it's proven that you can do this at a massive scale. Massive in terms of it's never been done at this scale as a peer-to-peer -peer mechanism ever before. Mm -hmm. That idea is infectious. Mm -hmm. Once you realize that that is possible, you, people will create uh, thousands of iterations of that idea, no matter how many times it fails and no matter how many times it collapses. So far, it hasn't collapsed. I'm hoping it won't. Sometimes the best technology doesn't win. The first one to achieve scale will be good enough wins. Bitcoin is not the best implementation possible. It's not the best conceived. We've already designed better systems, but Bitcoin may be the one that got good enough fast enough and ends up having a very serious global impact, or it might not. I'm less interested in Bitcoin, the currency, as I am in the peer-to-peer -peer consensus mechanism underlying it, which as a design pattern uh, can, will get respawned again and again and again, even if Bitcoin collapses. And that's why I try to discourage people from looking at Bitcoin as a currency or as a financial instrument or as a a stock to discourage people from using it for trading, and to use it instead um, as a means of exchange, uh, as perhaps a diversification strategy if you want to do it, but on a very small basis. And instead, invest in the most important thing you can invest in this space. And that's not Doge, whatever your word. That's skills. Uh, no, I, I've spent the last two and a half years working in this space, and I don't do it for the money, and I don't have a lot of bitcoins. I'm certainly not a bitcoin millionaire, as some people think. I'm flat broke, but I've invested in skills, and that's something that I know that if bitcoin crashes tomorrow, my ability to understand and innovate in cryptographic currencies and true consensus systems survives that and is a marketable skill that I can use again and again in different scenarios. Uh, because the next thing that comes up is also going to use that design pattern. That design pattern is unstoppable. So develop your skills in that. Don't invest in the currency. Uh, and, and that's the whole purpose of this group. No, there, there are already uh, thousands of people working on that, uh, on stress testing the Bitcoin network. Um, they're called hackers. They're trying to steal the money. They're trying to deny service. They're trying to crash the system. They're trying to discredit the network. Some of them work for governments. Some of them work for large corporations. Some of them work for some of the big banks. And they're trying to fuck with Bitcoin. And there's enough of them out there on a daily basis trying to fuck with Bitcoin. Uh, pardon my language. That, uh, there's plenty of stress testing going on. Transaction malleability was a perfect example of that. It was something that came up as an excuse by Mark Capellas to justify his own failures. And then within a week, it was a bot that was hitting the network pretty hard that someone decided to implement it to see how, who else was affected. But here's the thing. Two weeks later, transaction malleability bots didn't go away, but the problem stopped affecting the network. And the reason for that is because everybody fixed whatever problems they had. 
And so the problem went away without the source of the problem going away. The transaction malleability bot was still out there doing its thing, but it was no longer affecting the network. This is the essence of an anti-fragile ecosystem or an anti-fragile system, which is that, like a human immune system or an evolutionary mechanism, if you expose it to irritants, if you expose it to uh, disease, if you expose it to stress, uh, the system, because it is dynamic and because it consists of massively decentralized components that are individually managed and run, adapts to that stress. So people make small incremental changes on their own nodes, and they make them resilient to the latest attack. And gradually, the system builds immunity across a broad spectrum of attack scenarios, and becomes less and less fragile, more and more robust. In the early days of the internet. You know, five guys with five routers could take down Yahoo for a day. Uh, now, 50 million botnets with, uh, you know, that are able to generate six gigabits of traffic per second, sustained for 24 hours, can't even touch any of the big service providers or any of the big services. They can still touch some of the uh, Bitcoin things, as we saw recently. Uh, blockchain took a, took a nasty beating. Uh, with some denial of service uh, recently, uh, they were asking us for six Bitcoin in order to stop uh, attacking us. <laughs> six Bitcoin a month uh, to stop denying us uh, service. And uh, yeah, so we didn't pay that, obviously. Um, but then we become more resilient. So the Bitcoin system itself becomes more resilient over time. If you want to do stress testing, quite honestly, if you want to do stress testing, do it on testnet where you have the exact same code, and you can replicate the same behavior in a small set of nodes that are not production capable. And then take your findings and produce unit tests and increase the test coverage of Bitcoin Core. And that would be a very valuable service for the core developers. Uh, find edge cases and create tests that um, trigger those edge cases so that you can do regression testing against every version of uh, Bitcoin Core. That would be a very valuable service, but please do it on testnet. Uh, and, and let people know what you're doing first, so that they don't think it's a massive attack from the outside. You can post on the development mailing list and follow. And you know, if you think there's a particular edge case that's a risk, test it on your own client. Test it on a couple of different versions of Bitcoin Core. If you think it's a widespread pro problem, announce that you're going to do a test on testnet. Do a test on testnet. Find a solution to the problem, and post the patch and the, and the unit test to fix it. That's a valuable service. Uh, and if you don't find it, some hacker out there will. And don't worry, they're on the job. They're working hard. <laughs>
uh, because fraud has kept low all the transaction volume has gone up in the right. networks. So the reason that happened is because merchants started doing it regardless, and they did it because they considered the risk of chargebacks versus the volume of business an acceptable risk for small value yeah. transactions. Because if they can make it faster to process your coffee payment, they're going to sell more coffees. Yeah. And if someone charges back one out of ten coffees, they made up on it by selling twelve coffees instead of ten. Boom, done. This is what's going to happen on the Bitcoin network. You've got to understand the confirmation. There is no such thing as a confirmed transaction. It's just a matter of probabilities. One confirmation, two confirmations, three confirmations, two hundred and ninety-eight thousand confirmations on the Genesis block. I can tell you that the Genesis block can't be undone. And I can tell you that probably the next 280,000 blocks can't be undone. And, and so the probability decreases as you go through time. So the question is, what can you sell with an acceptable level of risk that is commensurate to the business value of increasing the volumes of sales through an easy transaction if you don't have settlement in 10 minutes? Can you sell a cup of coffee? Something you hand someone and they can walk out of the store and then double spend it? That's a risk worth taking. I can walk into the restaurant next door, sit down, have a meal, and as soon as I'm finished eating, get up and run away. And this happens every day in restaurants all around the world. And yet they don't bring you the check the moment you sit down and ask you to pay in advance. Uh, they take that risk as an acceptable part of the risk. For most of the items that you're going to sell for high value. Most businesses can't achieve delivery in 10 minutes, even if they wanted to. So, the good news is that the items that cost more generally take longer to actually hand to the customer. And so by that time you can build the necessary number of confirmations. What I expect to see is first of all, people will take that as an acceptable risk. And secondly, organizations that do merchant processing are going to offer a basic level of insurance where they will insure against that risk and take that risk on in order to erase it for the customers. I don't know if you guys are thinking about the bit pay, but if zero confirmation double spends become a problem, uh, then that's going to be addressed through an insurance management policy. It's an acceptable risk. So do you think that the subsequent, I want to say freak out, but just pretty extensive discussion on the mailing list was just more a philosophical discussion regarding the Coinbase issues that Mike brought up, or I sure as hell hope it was a philosophical discussion okay. because if that's pushed through consensus, we've got a problem. We need to build a new currency. Yeah. Um, if you violate the basic consensus voting mechanism and you say that blocks that have been mined can be unmined and Coinbase uh, rewards that have been earned can be unearned, uh, you've broken the basic covenant with the miners and you create massive problems. Because what it does is it opens the possibility for someone manipulating this extra voting system yeah. in ways that are unanticipated and are not aligned with the core incentives. The simplicity of the core consensus protocol is why it works. It's dangerous to mess with that. Uh, and most likely, I think if you took a consensus mechanism like that to the miners, you'd have to put it to a vote, and I would guess they'd vote no. Uh, because the risk it introduces, miners are getting more and more conservative in what they'll accept over time. And as, as I said, I expect it's going to be harder to make meaningful changes to the protocol rather than hijacked um, changes like this. For, for a while now, I believe that uh, the, there are very few external things that can damage Bitcoin on a massive scale anymore. Um, I think that most of the big bugs are being worked out. <coughs> the most dangerous type of bug right now is uh, some kind of vulnerability in the core um, elliptic curve signing mechanism or in the key generation mechanism, that leaks keys over a long period of time without being detected. So you need a bug that has an impact uh, on the core uh, trust mechanism of Bitcoin, which is the signing mechanism. That bug needs to have a widespread impact. It has to not be noticed for a long time or be difficult to fix. And it has to reveal a large percentage of the keys. If you had the combination of those five things, then that would fundamentally undermine the trust in uh, ownership of transactions and the signing mechanism, 
which would destroy the value of the system. Um, I don't think there is such a bug, because the fundamental algorithms are relatively simple, the signing protocols are pretty well understood, uh, the key generation mechanisms have improved over time. Um, I'm not worried that there's a widespread vulnerability in the elliptic curve mechanism. I think that's one of the only existential threats that Bitcoin could face, but who knows? Um, other than people losing their control over their private keys, pretty much every other scenario I can think of where you have a fundamental bug in Bitcoin uh, can, at worst, stop processing of transactions for a period of time, or cause us to need to roll back a bunch of transactions over a short period of time in order to fix a fundamental bug. For example, uh, a, a long fork uh, of more than a few blocks causing divergence of consensus, um, a fundamental flaw in the protocol that causes the network to shut down for a while. What that would do is it would trap the existing Bitcoin value in the hands of the people who control it, and that's a survivable problem. Because then we roll back to where we were before, fix the problem, reboot the network, and the owners of Bitcoin are still the same owners of Bitcoin, the fundamental trust mechanism. That's a survivable problem. You have to violate the fundamental ownership system in order to have a non-survivable uh, vulnerability in Bitcoin. And, and so far as I can tell, there, there aren't too many scenarios I can imagine that do that, and none of them are realistic. So, I may be overly optimistic, but I think after five years of everybody in the world trying to break this, for, because there's a $10 billion bounty behind breaking it, or as much of that as you can actually realize before it crashes, um, that's a pretty big hacker bounty. And so far, uh, there have been some pretty nasty bugs, and Bitcoin has survived them. Every time it survives, it gets stronger. Every time it's tested, it gets more resilient. I don't think there are any factors that can ruin it now, other than poor choices made uh, by developers that are then accepted by miners. And again, that's getting harder and harder to do. Last question of the evening. Last question. Going back to your hierarchical deterministic wallets, would you explain the difference between hardened and non-hardened extended keys and provide some use cases for each? And that's the first really technical, <laughs> hard question of the evening. Going beyond. Can you repeat the question? So, uh, in hierarchical deterministic wallets, explain, explain the difference between hardened and non-hardened branches, perhaps we should call them, okay. or derivative keys uh, within a branch of the hierarchical deterministic wallet and use cases for them. <laughs> I think the answer to that is no, I can't explain it. <laughs> I can give you a close approximation that is probably wrong. Uh, <laughs> let me think about this for a second. So, um, within the BIP32 uh, specification, there are two ways to derive uh, a sub key from a primary key, uh, from, a, from a branch. Um, one has a notation which has a little prime tick on it, right? and the other one is without. So if you use the key derivation algorithm, uh, I think it's called CDK, in, um, in bit 32 it's a function that's named CDK, and there's two of them, the CDK and CDK prime. Uh, CDK prime derives what's called a hardened key, and CDK der derives a non-hardened key. Um, the, what I understand it to be is the, the difference between um, the ability to derive further private keys below that branch, if you have that node's parent and um, its own private key, whether you can derive further private keys below that. Anybody want to give me some feedback on whether I got that answer right? It basically allows you to break the derivation chain. Cap it is what you're saying? Is that what you're saying? It cap the derivation? Undrivable after that point. It's undrivable after that point. Yes. So, you, so you can't you can't go further down. Uh, and what that allows you to do is create um, chains that can be derived from that uh, hardened key, but cannot be well rather that can be derived from its parent, but not from that key down. 
something like that. And it has to do with uh, the key derivation function. And it's used for, um, essentially, let's say you have a hierarchical deterministic wallet where you want to give two departments in your business uh, a branch each. And you don't want the parent organization, to, no, sorry, you don't want one of the siblings to be able to derive the keys of the other sibling by knowing the part of their own private key plus the public key of one of the parents. There's a thing where if you know your private key and you know the public key of the one of the parents, you can derive one of the siblings' private keys, and that allows you to extend their branch further down. But if you use the prime mechanism, you can't do that. That's my understanding, and it's not, I'm, I'm not entirely sure about how that works. Great question. Uh, that's something that would make for a great uh, workshop. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and if somebody understands the mathematics better than I do, I can explain it better. We have openings. All right. <laughs> great question to end the night on. Thank you so much. And that's Thank all. You. Thank you.